All right, hello. Welcome to the soil organisms um, lecture. So the first part, uh, we're going to talk about uh, animals, plants, and algae. So right here, this first slide, it's a um, video by a company called 59 Degrees out of Sweden on how to get the perfect soil. So when you uh, click on the lecture slides or have the lecture slides going as you watch along with the narrated lecture, uh, right here I would hit pause on this and I would click on the link there and it should take you to the YouTube video to watch uh, that video on how to get perfect soil. So in terms of this lecture, um, what, are we, what, what do we want to talk about when we talk, want to talk about soil organisms? So soils are teeming with life forms. That's what makes it fertile soil. So when we talk about a soil, by our definition, it must contain microbes. It must have microbial activity. And all the soil life forms are beneficial to soil development. Some are pathogenic, some are problem-causing, give pathogens to plants. So when we talk about fertile soil, when we talk about the idea of the soil being its own ecosystem and, and the soil being alive, these organisms are a big part in that. Um, these life forms, these organisms are responsible for humus development. Um, humus has a very high exchange capacity and water holding capacity and is great for soil structure and fertility like we talked about before. And so because of that, or um, the reason for that is because of these organisms and the role that these organisms play within the soil and, that, and them allowing um, this to happen to where they're going to make uh, nutrients available and they're going to help out with that exchange capacity and they're going to be um, moving around and um, creating pores and allowing for water and air to move in between. All of this is, is work done by these organisms and makes soil this alive ecosystem, this, this fertile soil, this, um, this absolute foundation for everything else that happens. So the first animals we'll talk about are vertebrates, so animals with an internal skeleton. They're not really very important uh, in terms of what we're talking about. Um, they can actually be pests, they can destroy crops. Um, where they do, where we do find importance for them is that they can aerate um, soils and kind of they, they plow the soils in a way by uh, doing grazing. And so because they graze, um, and they basically um, cause a disturbance and kind of allow the soil to be um, plowed in a way. They basically put in that disturbance to, to kind of kickstart the succession process again. Also in leaving their feces, they can help, um, help start the decomposition process because they leave something there and then the other organisms now have something to feed off of and start um, that process of turning uh, things um, things from the uh, above the soil into soil. Earthworms are uh, one of the uh, one of the group of roundworms and earthworms are very important in terms of um, doing organic degradation. So the idea is that they're one of these um, one of these uh, organisms that's very important in terms of the idea of um, causing things to degrade, causing things to, that weren't soil to now become soil, and taking that humus and that partially degraded organic matter and turning it into degraded organic matter or topsoil. Um, they are help produce kind of a super humus because it has a very high exchange capacity and that um, makes it easier for the minerals, or sorry, for the nutrients to go back and forth between the plant roots and the um, and the soil, which is absolutely a useful thing. Uh, average healthy soil has over a million earthworms per acre, and they process about two tons of organic matter daily. So two tons is is a high high number in terms of organic matter. If we just think about you know like a quarter ton truck or a half ton truck. And think about filling that up and you're talking about you know if it's a half ton filling it up four times if it's a quarter ton filling it up eight times with organic matter and that's the amount of organic matter that an earthworm or that um, a group of earthworms will um, 
will process. So it's ex they're extremely important in the soil. They're uh, mostly in the top six inches of the soil. The big problem uh, we face with agriculture, not so much in forestry, but definitely with agriculture, is that uh, they can easily be killed um, by by tillage, by fumigating, by flooding, or if you have ar arid areas with droughty soils. So that's why uh, irrigation, like we've talked about before, is extremely important. Um, that's why getting the right amount of water and not being flooded is important. And that's also um, why when um, you'll see other practices um, like not tilling the soil and, and um, newer agricultural practices coming out because we understand now how important these organisms are in this soil um, development process. So here's just some of those examples um, of different critters that are in the soil. So we've got our earthworms down on the left. We've got a nice example of a vertebrate um, on our right and then just kind of um, up above the different things that they can do within the soil as they as they move around and and how they're gonna um, change the look of the soil. In terms of arthropods, um, think of like our, our bugs and insects. So when we're specifically talking arthropods, we're saying hard exoskeletons and segmented body parts including legs. So uh, ants, termites, millipedes, centipedes, beetles, these sorts of things. Um, these ones feed on decaying vegetation and churn the soil. So the idea is that they're going to eat um, decaying vegetation and then um, they're also by moving around and by um, digging around they're going to kind of churn the soil and, and um, kind of naturally till the soil themselves. Um, however, clear ground cover around the holes which can open up um, can lead to soil erosion. So Sometimes if you get too big of holes or you get a lot of holes, um, that can lead to a good amount of soil erosion. But um, usually with these bugs, their uh, they're good outweighs their bad. And so over on the right here, we have an example of a food web and showing the uh, organic debris that then gets ate by the, the fungi and the bacteria. And then the fungi gets ate by the beetles and the mites and the springtails. And eventually, um, you know, the, the other things that are within the soil, like the earthworms, snails, and slugs, and those things get eaten by ants. And so you can see that these, these arthropods, they have their, uh, their, their use in the food chain. They're, they're there to uh, basically feed on, on vegetation, feed on these other animals, and kind of keep the, uh, the food web happening within the soil. Gastropods, uh, coiled shelled skeletons and singular muscular foot for creeping. Uh, we're talking about slugs and snails and as a proud UC Santa Cruz banana slug, I um, now see much more the importance of slugs than I used to. Definitely was one of those kids who would throw snails around and not and you know crush their shells on accident, sometimes on purpose and just uh, did not understand the importance to, uh, to soil and to vegetation. So um, one of the, the benefits of gastropods is that they do feed on decaying vegetation, um, but one of the negatives is that they feed on plants as well. And that's why people um, were okay with, you know, kids destroying um, slugs or snails. And, um, you know, they see them more as a pest. They don't understand that they're also there uh, eating uh, that decaying vegetation, turning that organic matter into humus and into soil. And they're also good soil builders, um, but really it's the idea that people see them as plant pests um, that's problematic. Nematodes. Uh, nematodes are almost microscopic, unsegmented roundworms. So remember earthworms? We're also in that roundworm category. So we also have nematodes, which are also a form of roundworm. Now, um, nematodes can feed on organic matter. They can also be predaceous on other nematodes, and they can be parasitic on plants. So they're kind of hitting that trifecta of they're really good in terms of um, feeding on organic matter, helping it um, degrade more. <clears throat> 
they also are a positive in that they eat uh, other nematodes, but then they have that negative of being parasitic on plants, just um, similar to um, similar to snails in that um, they're they're seen as a pest on plants. Um, some of the species of nematodes are very very bad for um, plants and putting out very bad pathogens. Uh, one method for uh, for control is a uh, uh, soil fumigation. So um, putting um, pesticides into the ground, but the, the big thing is that kills all the other organisms as well. And so if you're just trying to kill the nematodes, you're, you're going to kill everything else as well with fumigation. Um, some nematodes can create humus via digestion of organic matter. So that, it, that becomes a true positive in terms of um, soil. And they can crawl in soil pores, so they really do prefer sandy soils, definitely not clay soils because it's too hard for them to move around in the clay soils. So um, the size of nematodes, very small, not quite microscopic, but not that far from it because on the left we have a human hair strand and then on the right we have a nematode. So we're looking at, you know, roughly something like the, the size of a human hair strand. So very small, but not quite microscopic. In terms of plants, um, what we really want to talk about is the rhizosphere, which is the volume of soil surrounding plant roots that physically and chemically interact with the root. The word rhizo itself just means relating to the root or roots, and it's a very complex ecosystem of microbial species. Now, well, shouldn't an ecosystem be a big thing? With this, uh, the amount of microbial species we're talking about, bacteria, fungi, nematodes, we're talking about things that are very small and in just millions and millions and millions and millions of them. So it's its, its own tiny little ecosystem within the, the bigger ecosystems. Um, it's got, in the rhizosphere, you've got uh, symbiotic relationships with plant roots, but you also have parasitic relationships with plant roots. So just kind of going over that terminology again, symbio symbiotic relationship, um, they're getting good out of it. Each side is getting good out of it. Parasitic, one is feeding off of the other and one is, uh, one is benefiting, but the other one is suffering. Um, you can get uh, complex chemical reactions uh, within the rhizosphere, including antibiotics, attractants, repellents, and and also exchanging food sources between the roots and the microbes. The idea of exchanging water and minerals and um, uh, for sugar, basically. Uh, and then usually you get higher organic matter and um, more acidic uh, in the soil around the rhizosphere than you do around the the rest of the soil. And you also get be better drainage and aeration because you've got the uh, roots pushing through this area and so they 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 basically leave um, a tunnel system and it's all set up for when the next plant or when the other roots want to come in and uh, spread out so you so you have better drainage and aeration and then you usually get the higher organic matter because you've got these animals um, or these organisms hanging around the uh, the area around the plants and um, what's interesting though is it's it's going to be more acidic around this area. So you really want to take a look and um, thinking about your pH, you already know that we would prefer that six and a half to seven and a half pH. You're probably going to end up a little more on the acidic side. So you already kind of know what you need to do in terms of trying to help out uh, your plants if we've studied pH well enough. So looking at the rhizosphere, so on the right hand side here, we got a diagram. So this area in the blue would be the rhizosphere and we'd see our root hairs and our epidermis and the root cap and all these different uh, parts of the root that are out there in terms of a diagram. If we look on the left, what does that actually look like? So this is what we call a um, plug where everything that's kind of that orangish color, orangish reddish color, that's, that's soil. And then you see the plant rooting in there and you can see all the different roots, the long tap root and the lateral roots. Uh, going off to the side of it, and you can kind of see how they merge into the soil. 
So uh, this slide right here has another video uh, on the rhizosphere. So uh, make sure to hit pause right here and click on the lecture slides. Watch the, uh, the rhizosphere video and just kind of um, understand that, that complex ecosystem that's happening uh, below the ground, below the plant. Our other, uh, our other uh, topic that we wanted to talk about in, in part one is the algae. So all algae need light, so they'll be in the top half inch of the surface. We got two um, big categories of algae. So we got green algae, and they're green because they contain chlorophyll. And so they're major producers of organic matter, such as sugar, starch, cellulose, that are going to end up in the soil. So they're important in terms of the soil because they've got something to give, which is they've got the sugar produced from photosynthesis and so they're willing to give that to the soil and the soil then is willing to say well here what about these nutrients and um, from these minerals and what about this water and that that kick starts that exchange between the two in terms of diatoms they're algae with silica in cell walls so they can um also for this photosynthesized, but much less than green algae. After all, if they could do more, they'd be green algae. Um, but diatomaceous earth um, can be made out of diatoms. And so hopefully you're saying, what is diatomaceous earth? And then you get to this next slide and you find out diatomaceous earth is, it's basically a um, insecticide or um, some sort of uh, type of um, insect killer that's made from the fossilized remains of tiny aquatic organisms called diatoms or this algae called diatoms and their skeletons are made of silica and so over a long period of time the diatoms accumulate uh, are accumulated in rivers streams lakes and oceans and so what they do is they go and mine these areas especially areas that uh, used to be covered in water and aren't anymore so like uh, the Kern River floodplain the Kern River is still flowing there, but a lot of the area that used to be the floodplain is not covered by water anymore. So that's an, those are areas where you can go and find people uh, mining for silica and trying to um, pull out things that you can, uh, the silica that you can use to make diatomaceous earth. Um, diatomaceous earth products, you can use them against bed bugs, crickets, cockroaches, fleas, tick spiders, and other pests. So it's just kind of an interesting thing with... Uh, you might not think of a insect killer being made out of algae, but that's kind of, the, that's what diatomaceous earth is. So right here, I've put some questions. Uh, you can pause it, write down the questions, try and answer it. Just that way you can um, kind of start preparing yourself for the test. And I'm going to go ahead and go on to part two. So we've got uh, fungi, uh, lichens, bacteria, and microbial activity in the second part here. So if you need a break, I'd say pause it here, um, write some stuff down, take a break. If not, we're going to plow through. So right here, I've attached two videos. So uh, one of them is a video from the Cal Academy of Sciences, uh, kind of takes you into the soil and lets you see what's going on beneath our feet, which I think is, is really cool. And then another video um, from 59 Degrees about that goes into uh, the different parts of the soil food web and really getting comfortable with that idea of what's in the food web and how do these organisms all fit and why do they end up having to work together. So our first part of part two is extremely important and that's the fungi. So it's a whole kingdom of life forms comprised of single or multicellular forms uh, they're heterotrophic with no true organs and uh, mostly just thread-like mycelia. So you can get molds, mildews, rust, smuts, mushrooms. Those are all part of the fungi. Uh, we're really, usually when we think of fungi or fungus, we think of mushrooms because that's what we can see above the soil. But we got all of these other parts. It's a whole kingdom of organisms. Um, so that's way up in terms of... Uh, when we're talking about species and we're talking about kingdom, you've got a lot of levels before you get um, all the way up to kingdom. So lots of things are within uh, the kingdom of fungi. Uh, these are major decomposers of organic matters and complex minerals. So they are absolutely great soil builders. So 
um, hopefully in those videos you saw uh, the web that can be created by by the mycelia around the roots and really allows them to get that extra stretch and stretch out that um, that root zone to where they can get lots and lots of minerals and lots more water and then that helps them become these great soil builders because it really uh, increases the exchange capacity within the soil. Um, the one negative to, to fungi is that they're, uh, they do complete, compete with the plants for some minerals. Uh, many species are major plant pathogens, so uh, you do have them causing some problems to plants, but overall, in terms of fungi, they are much more positive for the soil than they are negative. The uh, one big thing, though, with, uh, with fungi, because of the way they are, and hopefully any of you who are used to um, fungi, um, like mushrooms and things like that, are... are um, understanding of this, they need well aerated soils with lots of organic matter and moisture. So if I'm going to go um, mushroom hunting, if I'm one of those people who, who um, finds that of interest, where am I going to go? I'm going to go into forests and I'm going to go into forests where it rains quite a bit because that's an area that I know is going to have a lot of organic matter and a lot of moisture. So the soil is going to be well aerated. And so that makes sense. Having soils that get farmed a lot, and get compacted to where there's not a lot of space for air and water to travel through um, and there's not also going to be a lot of organic matter on the soil not going to see a lot of fungi within that area so that's also another reason when people talk about um, trying to change farming practices knowing the importance of fungi in terms of being great soil builders and being a major decomposer of organic matter and help helping out in this uh, this idea of um, exchange between the soil and the plants and the organisms um, because we know of its importance that's what where, where we start saying well maybe these things we're doing conventional agriculture could be a lot better so just some examples of um, mycelia on the right so that um, kind of just the thread like structure that can spread out throughout the soil mushrooms down on the bottom left which were all much more uh, used to seeing and then just an example of a water mold on the top left so mycorrhizae uh, that's a fun fungi that forms a symbiotic relationship with the plant roots and um, the plants feed and house the fungi and the fungi helps the plants obtain more water and nutrients so that's the big that's the symbiotic relationship the plant feeds and houses the fungi it, it lives on the plant and attaches on the roots and then the fungi helps the plant to obtain more water and nutrients by spreading out farther than the plant roots can go and it can increase usable soil volume up to a hundred times and also it secretes chemicals that rapidly degrade the minerals to release plant nutrients such as phosphates so that becomes an important part to this whole um to this whole process where it really it it helps to get the plant to release um nutrients and those nutrients would not release without the without the mycorrhizae so that's what's really important to understand with fungi and why it's important in terms of being um a part of the soil is that it it without it some of these nutrients would not be released and we know that soil needs certain nutrients and the plants need certain nutrients you got two major forms of mycorrhizae you got ectomycorrhizae and you got endomycorrhizae so the ectomycorrhizae forms a sheath around the roots and can penetrate between the root cells only whereas the endomycorrhizae penetrates into the host cells so the ectomycorrhizae forms a protective sheath around the roots and then um, can penetrate between the root cells only whereas the ectomycorrhizae actually goes into the cells and so over 80 percent of crop species and all perennial tree species contain mycorrhizae and in many cases the the fungi like i said is necessary for survival of the plant because it can go that extra um, to those extra areas within the soil that the plant roots just can't reach so here's just a couple examples of just plant roots with that um, with that mycorrhizae around it and stretching out. 
Uh, our second category was lichens. So it's a symbiotic relationship between an algae and a fungus. So the fungus houses, houses the single cell algae. So the algae lives on the fungus and then, um, then it photosynthesizes sugars for the fungus. So the algae can then photosynthesize sugars for the fungus. So it gives it food. The fungus gives it a place to, to live and grow. Nice symbiotic relationship. These lichens are major decomposers of rocks and dead trees, and that becomes important in the idea that lichens are one of the first creatures to show up in terms of primary succession. So when we don't have soil, lichens are one of these things that can come in and um, sit, settle on the rocks and help that decomposing process, which is that basic start to, to soil. And so they play an important role. Uh, role especially in primary succession and lichens you can find them in all land areas of the world bacteria is huge in terms of of uh, soil development and and as a soil organism and as a participant in this soil ecosystem so the number of bacteria exceeds that of all the other microbes in the soil so in one gram of soil, it can have a million uh, bacteria. Now in our minds, bacteria, because of what we know um, can hurt us, bacteria has a negative connotation. But in the soil, bacteria is, is, is a positive thing. can be a negative thing, but definitely a positive thing. Um, so in terms of autotrophic bacteria, um, they have energy obtained from photosynthesis or certain minerals. While in heterotrophic bacteria, the energy is obtained from organic forms in the soil. So um, your most common bacteria in the soil is going to be your heterotrophic bacteria, um, especially the uh, act actinomycetes. Um, but uh, you can have some of this heterotrophic bacteria being pathogenic. Uh, mostly, um, most of it though degrades uh, dead material to humus, which is perfect and important and really good for our understanding of how does how does that process happen. So, if we say humus is partially degraded soil matter, how did it happen? How does poop and how does dead animals and how do leaves and twigs and all these other things on the forest floor or on our ag fields? turn into soil and the first step in that is going to be mostly this bacteria and specifically the heterotrophic bacteria um, autotrophic bacteria also plays a part in that they can oxidize minerals to usable form so trying to get that nitrogen that's in the atmosphere in the unusable form and get it into that ammonia in the soil which is a usable form and then also um, then doing the denitrification and getting it back out into the atmosphere which takes us to the idea of nitrogen fixing bacteria. So the idea that um, that they can change the the gaseous form of nitrogen in the atmosphere and change it to that usable NH4 ammonia um, that can actually be nitrogen that's used within the soil and becomes part of this nitrogen cycling and and provides nitrogen to the plants. Um, so you have free living nitrogen bacteria that live in the soil pores and you've got symbiotic nitrogen fixing bacteria which live inside the plant roots free living account for almost all the nitrogen fixation on earth about 15 pounds per acre per year that's a lot of nitrogen fixation and then the symbiotic exists mostly in the legume family so peas and beans alfalfa clovers um, peanuts can also do this as well but um, mostly uh, within this legume family, um, you get uh, these bacteria that they're going to live on uh, nodules on the roots. They're going to provide that ammonia to the plants. And then what do they get out of it? They get to live on the plant and they get the sugars from the plant. So they get pumped up because they're getting sugar and energy from the plant. And in, then in exchange, they take this nitrogen in the soil that's in this gaseous form and turn it into ammonia that then the plant can use. And so um, that's why anything that's in the pea family, bean family, alfalfa, clover, all these things, they don't need nitrogen fertilizers because they, do, they provide their own nitrogen. So here's an example of that idea of um, what's, a, what's a root nodule and how are they living 
within that nodule. So uh, if we look at the top right here, you've got your root hairs. And in the root hairs, uh, there's an infection thread where the bacteria works its way in. And this is that symbiotic bacteria. And then uh, it becomes a nodule as it swells up and sticks out of um, the root. And so on the right there, all those little balls sticking out on the roots, those are the nodules. And so if we look at more like a close-up diagram of it, here's our Here's our uh, member of the legume family because we see um, right where it says the word photosynthesis just to the left of it. We see that nice bean pod or pea pod. So we know it's a legume. So we know it does this nitrogen fixing and has these nitrogen fixing bacteria. So we look at the roots and we see those nodules down there. And if we were to zoom in with a microscope, we'd see all this bacteria living in that nodule. And it's there to be able to take in. The plant takes in that nitrogen um, through uh, stomata um or or through um, lenticels whatever um, pores it has that it can bring in the nitrogen and then it's going to be this bacteria in the soil that then is going to change it to ammonia and make it usable for the plant so it's amazing when you really think about it so just trying to um kind of give you the diet the whole diagram of that so we've got nitrogen in our atmosphere 78 percent of it the majority of our atmosphere is nitrogen because when we think about it we need oxygen but if you think about human beings as a whole of the earth there is way more grass and way more plants and way more trees than there are people so therefore our atmosphere is way more nitrogen than it is oxygen and the reason is we need that nitrogen to make this soil and to make the whole process and to create this whole foundation of the earth that we think of as, as the soil ecosystem. So here's another look at it, trying to put everything into it. So we got that nitrogen in the atmosphere, we got the nitrogen fixing bacteria in the root nodules, we got uh, nitrogen fixing soil bacteria, uh, we got some decomposers, we got our little uh, vertebrate animal there munching on the uh, plant and then pooping. And then uh, we've got the plant roots decomposing, the parts of the plants decomposing, and the whole cycle, all of this is that nitrogen cycle happening within the soil. And these organisms are crucial in this cycle. In terms of microbial activity, so um, the big thing to understand with the microbial activity is generally conditions that are best for plant growth are also best for microbial activity. So if you can grow plants, you're going to have microbes. And if you're going to have um, microbes in the soil, then that's fantastic because then you've got um, all of these little, little things that want to um, create organic matter and process organic matter. So what are those conditions? What, what makes sense for lots of microbial activity? Temperatures about 80 degrees, uh, water to field capacity, loamy soils that have that lots of pore space, but they can also move water well and they can hold water well, and a pH close to 7. That's why that ideal plant growth is 6.5 to 7.5. And, and overall, this makes for good fertile soil. And so in temperate climates like the continental U.S., um, regular precipitation becomes the most important factor most important factor in building the soil microbe population. So if you've got precipitation, you're going to have this great microbial activity. If you have an arid region, that's where it gets tough and where you lack that microbial activity. And that's why you'll see a lot less organic matter in more arid places, even um, deserts where you see no organic matter, and you're going to not have any microbial activity. And that's why your soil isn't good for being able to grow plants. Um, good uh, or use of good cultural practices like crop rotation, integrated pest management, and low tillage or no tillage or conservation tillage will help maintain this um, balanced microbe population and um, basically keep the microbes happy. Because one thing that could happen is if your microbes are happy, that's great. They're very helpful for your soil. If the microbes don't have what they need, then they, become, they can uh, become pathogenic or the pathogenic uh, microbes start outnumbering. Um, the helpful microbes. So micro, microbes can be helpful, but they can also be pathogenic, and it really depends on um, how healthy the soil is because when the conditions are best for plant growth, the microbes are happy. When it's not best for plant growth, that's when the microbes can cause problems. 
So for the part two, here's some more uh, lecture quiz questions. Pause it, write down the questions, um, put down your answers. If you um, have any questions, you can always email me or let me know. Here is a video that I think sums it all up and does a great, uh, great summary of everything and really kind of puts the whole thing together and probably and does it in my mind better than I can. So watch this video. Um, let me know if you enjoy it because I enjoy it. I think it's great. I think it really sums it up. And with that, um, I'll see you next time.